So we will start today's lesson on photo sweetening. It's lesson six. Could you sign yes. me the other I don't think I got it. Sure, what number are you on? Um, 11, it looks like. Yep. Let's see if it's listed. It shows that you're offline. And you're logged in? Yeah, I am. Hmm. Can, uh, do you have a thumb drive and maybe give it to yeah, somebody next to you? you probably receive it faster that way anyways. Thanks. Okay, so the in this folder one, Liquify, I have a CR2, which means this is a camera raw image shot with a Canon camera. And then I have an example file. If you take the image that's a CR2 and you drag it into the Photoshop icon, it may work if you double click. It depends on how your preferences are set and let go. It is going to make sure I do it right. Open up in Photoshop, or it's supposed to. There we go. And it's going to open up with a little different interface than what we're used to. So we'll give it a second. And this is our basically editor or uh, opportunity to edit camera raw images in Photoshop. So this is the image as it came out, and this if you shot it as an RGB on the camera. Um, it's uh, a little bit maybe underexposed, um, you know, it's fine, but we may want to make some changes to it to make it much more dynamic. You notice over to the right we have a bunch of sliders, and I'm just going to go kind of level one, maybe into a little bit of a level two of camera raw. This is much deeper if you, if you really want to get into it. But you notice I have a temperature slider, so as I dra drag that one way or the other, it's going to change the overall temperature of the image. We'll leave that where it was. I have a tint, which is going to tint it with either a green tint or more of a magenta tint. So these are common exposure problems with images. If your image isn't properly white balanced, you can go in here and, and change the white balance. You can also change the temperature manually. Once you get what you like, you can go into your exposure. Your exposure is how bright or how dark your image is. So if you shot something and it's a little too dark and you just pull your exposure up, Instead of having to sh have shot it perfectly in, uh, with, with your camera, with your, your f-stop at the right amount, um, you are now allowed to, because camera raw is shooting so much more information than you really need, take it an f-stop or two one way or the other, which gives us a brighter image, which is non-destructive, or a darker image, which is non-destructive. So in this case, I'm going to put it back at zero. And I'm just going to key it up just a hair and just increase the exposure kind of works like our levels command in traditional Photoshop. Recovery is going to bring in some pixels that might have got lost if you if you have trouble um, in, in some areas where it gets whited out or it becomes too dark. Fill light works like a fill flash. A traditional flash lights up the whole subject. A fill flash is something that you use when you already have plenty of light and you're just trying to get rid of some shadows or just brighten the image up a little bit. So it kind of works like the exposure but it, it, uh, it doesn't change the overall contrast of the whole image. So you notice as I pull this up, it's almost like just brightening the whole thing with a little bit of a flash, but it's not a very dramatic brighten. Blacks. The more I bring this up, the deeper and the darker the blacks get in the image. And you see how it's becoming much more thick and dynamic. Brightness does exactly what a normal brightness does. It brightens everything, including the blacks. And so in this case, I probably don't want to mess with it too much. Contrast, amount of dark and light and the relationship between the dark and light, so I can up or down on that one. Clarity gives you the illusion of a little more sharpening, so if your image is kind of soft when you shoot it, you can push the clarity up and it gives you a little sharpening. Vibrance is the, the vibrance of the color and saturation is the saturation. So as you see, that I pull this up, it becomes more saturated. If I pull it down, it becomes less saturated, right? All the way to black and white. So we have tons of options here that we can apply to a, to a camera raw image. We can also go in, and I forget which slider it is, so I might have to click a couple, and go into, uh, so you've got sharpening and a bunch of stuff. I want to go into the vignetting here. Yeah. Is that the right one? Oh, okay. There we go. So if you go, thank you. If you go to lens corrections here, click on manual and come over here to lens vignetting. Remember when we've created kind of the burnt edges around the corners? If you pull this back, you're going to notice it's going to burn those edges for you. Or if you go the other way, it will lighten those edges for you and give you a little more of a 
heavenly image. This is a little more of a focused image. And you can adjust the midpoint so that determines how far it goes in or how far it recedes on the corners. One thing that's really nice about this is once we have these, these uh, specifications saved, we can actually batch apply them to a whole set of images without having to do it one by one. And if you notice if I hit done on my image, I can come over here and you see there's a little XMP file next to my CR2 image. This is basically all the instructions we just gave Photoshop um, to, to modify or change our image. And so almost like those adjustment layers we've used before in Photoshop, this is a non-destructive way to edit our image. This file will always write alongside that CR2 file and can be changed at any time. If I double click it, so I go back into the CR2 file, all of our changes are there, but I can go ahead and make more or less of them and it doesn't destroy my image in any way. Once I get it how I like it, to bring it into Photoshop and start to use it in layouts, I need to put open image. And when I open it, now it becomes just like a regular JPEG or any other image that we use in Photoshop, and it's something that we can start to play with. Question. Yes. So if you delete that XMP, then the, all of a sudden it will just disappear. Yes. And then it'll go right back to where it was. Yes. Um, another thing, it's a great question, is you have the bridge in Photoshop, and I'm trying to figure out where it is. Let's see if I... What's that? Space bar. Command space bar. Oh, on the spotlight. <coughs> so you see this CS bridge here. This is a, a media viewer in Photoshop that allows you to look at you know lots of different objects. This is a great way to if if I wanted to pull a folder or something over into here to look at multiple CR2s at a time, select multiple ones. Um, if I go to my desktop on this side and say I want to go into folder 6 you know I want to grab images that are in here for students or whatever this is a great media viewer and if I double click out of that it will automatically open up that camera raw editing tool um, if we have multiple camera raw images so I've got this CR2 and I've got another one here if I click them and open them at the same time you notice how we have both here I could actually take this one shift click it and do synchronize indicate all the different things I want to synchronize and it will modify this one to match with the same alterations so again that's where you can do some batching and I'll go ahead and cancel that yes um, now you said that it is it distracted to the picture and so can you go back in and change it if you want to change the levels? At, an, at any time yeah but now this version that's opened up in Photoshop that I would start to lay out mm -hmm then those changes have been made. So the source is good. The source file, the original CR2 is still good, but this one as I start to manipulate will be just like any other image we've used before. Great question. Yes? So how do you print a CR2? Like, can you just click on the CR2 and print it from there? It, it depends on your workflow. So I, I believe you can print it out of this menu if you wanted to print straight CR2. Most people bring it into Photoshop. Um, actually, do we have print as an option here? I believe Lightroom, you can easily do it. You can also crop in this, which is kind of neat. Um, and your camera software will help you let you do it also. Yeah, so if you download the Canon software or something, Photoshop's going to want you to open it into Photoshop, most likely, or save it out as a JPEG, which is fine. The, the printing, it's not going to give you any advantage to print for a CR2 versus a JPEG um, because you have plenty of color information there. But I, I've really... I, I've never had a need to do it, so I can't give you an exact answer. I'm sorry. Other question? So what is the difference between opening it up raw in Photoshop and Lightroom? Because can't you do the same thing in Lightroom and set the preset? Lightroom has a lot more editing features than this Photoshop uh, camera raw viewer or editor. Um, so it just really depends on your workflow. In Lightroom, you can't do layouts. Um, there's some, there's some uh, filters and features that aren't part of what's in Photoshop. So it really depends on how you work as a photographer or as an artist and how you want your workflow to be. If you're shooting wedding photos all day and making corrections on skin and zits and stuff like that, Lightroom is probably great. Um, but if you are a graphic designer using the photographs, then you want to bring them into Photoshop. People will use both together as well. So you can open those camera raw images in Photoshop 
you know, as, as regular JPEGs once you're done editing them as well. So the first thing I wanted to show you on this, this image here is um, we have a couple problems with it. Um, I probably want to sharpen it and adjust a few other things maybe, but if we're, today we're going to kind of be very uh, petty and uh, just try to make reality um, even better than reality is. And I, I want to show you how you would fix her arm. So she's kind of got a little bulge poking out on her arm here. And in the modeling world, well. yes, but we didn't want buff triceps, so we, we need to uh, basically slim out her arm. There's a few different ways you can do it, but I'm going to show you probably the quickest and easiest, and that's just to use a liquify tool. We've talked about that a little bit in class. If you go up to your filter menu and you go down to liquify, you can make a selection there. But for me, I always prefer to make a copy of the image I'm working on, then go filter, liquify. From here, what I find is that you want to get a really big brush. So I'm going to go over my brush and make it really big. And the reason why you want it to be big is if you get a little brush and you try to make lots of little pushes on her arm, you're going to get little bumps, right? A bigger brush is going to be more forgiving um, and it's going to allow you to take a bigger area and kind of squeeze it in. You want to have selected the forward warp tool here at the top. And again, this can work for arms, for legs, for all kinds of body parts, and it just allows us to kind of trim things out. So if I come over here to her arm, I try to find where the middle is, and I just hold in my mouse and I just kind of pull. You see I can kind of fix her arm a little bit. That might be a little skinny. Um, so if I don't like it, I come over here to the reconstruct tool. Is that what this one is? Oh, it's lagging. There we go. And if I rub it around on the image, it will go back to how it originally was. Um, you can also do an undo. The nice thing about the reconstruct tool, though, is if there's some other things that you've done that you like, it will only fix those areas. And boy, this is sure lagging. Come on. If you wanted just to make her arm really weird, this is a great way. Ah. Okay, I don't know why we've seemed to lock up here. Escape. Are you guys experiencing the same thing? Mm -hmm. It's pretty loud. Uh, I'm sure it's just I'm going to pause our. Should I? Oh, 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 no, we're not back. All right, I'm going to force quit Photoshop. So this is one of those tools that you can use to make life better or worse. You can do some really fun stuff. Yes. I'm going to go ahead and adjust my image size so that it doesn't want to use so much RAM and see if that maybe helps <coughs> filter liquify big brush way too big anyways you can see how you can very quickly make an alteration now, it's also pulled out my wall a little bit, so I may want to recrop it. Uh, again, if I was doing this, I would probably come in here and, and pull in her, her stomach a little bit, too. And it's probably everything's just fine in reality, but this isn't reality. How come? Won't let me zoom, zoom in there. Let's see. I'm having computer issues, but you get it, right? we'd be able to pull that in. So that's the first thing I wanted to show you is, is that there's an opportunity there to quickly make some, uh, some adjustments. Now here's, a, here's an example of that image just with a few other things um, added to it. Uh, these are tricks or techniques that we've talked about in class. The first thing I did was I copied her image and uh, I made an adjustment um, to the uh, 
you can see if you, if you turn it up, I made an adjustment to the color balance and then I pulled it down a little bit. Um, I made another adjustment to the color balance. I made it black and white, pulled it to 50%, and then I did that technique that we talked about last week where I did a high pass, basically a, a real um, intense sharpening on it. You can see the difference there. And if we take a look at this photo versus you know what really came out of our camera when I showed you the original camera raw, which was even more bland than this, we're starting to see how they get some of the images or the high-end images that you'll see in advertisements or billboards or signs, right? So that's the first thing I wanted to show you. So we've learned kind of what camera raw is. We've learned that the liquify tool is used all over the place in photo editing. So we don't need to feel bad. Nobody looks like we think they look. Next question. Huh? Um, where, how do you, or where do you Great. Let me, uh, well, let me open this up and show you. There's two things you can do is you can make a uh, an adjustment layer by clicking the little cookie and go to color balance here. And then you can go in and make some adjustments. And then, for instance, on this one, I could say, all right, those are the adjustments I want, but I don't want it to apply to her because she looks like an Oompa Loompa. And you notice anytime we do adjustment layer, there's a mask over here. So if we click on the mask, and we get our tools. Man, this is annoying. So we get our, uh, our paint, paint brush, and we have black and we have white. We get a big soft paint brush. We can actually paint out that adjustment. You notice over here, it's filling into my mask. And so this is used, again, all the time in photo treatments for backgrounds that look too good to be real, the saturation's up or whatever. And it gives us the composite of the two. Great question. Other questions? All right. Um, this next one I want to show you is how we can do some skin smoothing in, uh, in Photoshop. If you want to open up this CR2 in Photoshop, you end up with an image that looks like this. Now, this is pretty dull. Like it was, the camera wasn't set very well. Our exposure is pretty bad, so we need to make some quick adjustments to it. I'm going to go ahead and up the exposure so she comes out a little bit better, right? That's a pretty big difference, right? Um, I can look on the fill light, which should give me a little finer adjustment there. I'm going to adjust the blacks, which will give me a little more contrast. Um, brightness, maybe just a hair. Clarity, I'll go ahead and sharpen it up a little bit. And then the saturation, I'll pump it up just a hair more. And we'll say that's good. So you notice immediately it created that XMP file here. It's opening up in Photoshop. And now I can kind of do some heavy lifting or some, some work on this object. Um, I'll show you in a minute uh, a quick way that, that uh, when you're doing a lot of post-production that you identify problems in an image. But uh, um, from now, let's just open this up and start working on it. Try to find areas that need improvement on her skin. Um, she has a nose ring. Let's pretend we don't want that. So we need to basically clone it out. Um, I usually like to make a copy of my image or at least work on independent layers. I'm going to copy this one and then I'm going to do use my clone tool but I'm going to do it on its own layer. So I'm going to click a new layer, come over here, the one that looks like a rubber stamp, my clone. I'm going to get a paintbrush that's soft, and I'm going to get a size that's going to work for me. The clone tool works like a rubber stamp. It's going to suck up tone, image, or whatever from, from one part of my document and drop it somewhere else and basically clone it out, right? So I leave everything here to, to normal. I usually like to set my opacity like about 75% so I don't hit it at full blast. I'll zoom in on my object, and then I want to find some skin that I can basically drop from one area to another. So I'm going to make my brush a little smaller. I'll grab the skin just above this nose ring. And uh, you know what? Before I do that, I've got to make one, one quick concession, and that is along the top here where it says current layer, I want to do all layers. My current layer doesn't have anything to clone on it, right? It's transparent. So make sure you choose all layers up here. Now if I option, hold down option, it allows my clone to suck up a pattern, 
suck up this pattern, come over here to where her nose is, click a couple times and drop it there, I can quickly get away from that nose ring. The clone tool is the old way that a lot of healing or fixes were made in Photoshop to make a design look, or sorry, a photograph look better. It's still great and for some things it's absolutely essential. But there's a new tool in Photoshop, it's been around for a little while, but it's newer when you look at the lifespan of Photoshop called the healing tool. If you go down in your left column to the tool just below the eyedropper, there's a, a healing brush. There's a spot healing brush or just a standard healing brush tool. I prefer the standard healing brush tool. If you click on that, you immediately have up here at the top some, uh, some options that are similar to what we just saw in the clone tool. I like to get a brush that's very soft and I like to do a little trick. You come up here, I like to squeeze it and turn it. Why? I just learned it one time and it seems like instead of just dropping a very blatant circle of, um, of color or manipulation onto my image, if I do this it seems a little more natural. I'll go ahead and pull the size up a little bit. What the healing brush does is it allows us to copy kind of a texture and a tone from one part of our image and apply it to another and magically it kind of heals. Now the other thing I want to do here at the top is you see where it says current <coughs> layer? I want to drop down and do all layers just like we did with the clone tool because I want to work independently on a layer that's going to be called, I'll just call it touch up. So that way if I don't like it I can always throw it away and I haven't destroyed my original image. So I get my clone tool, I go find an area where she has even tone on her skin and it's smooth. I'm just going to choose this area. I'm going to option click it. Oops. Zoom back in. And then I can come over to areas where she needs some work and I just click and drag. And it's going to kind of get rid of them for me. And it's kind of amazing. The shorter area that you drag, usually the better. Now if you do a clone that doesn't look good, you can just Apple Z undo it and then option click an area maybe it's a little closer. So I can option click here. And I'm just going to go through here and remove anything that could be distracting on her face. Ah, I'm having real computer problems. So she's got some scars. I'm just kind of clicking and pulling and dragging. Get rid of this mole. Who's used the healing tool before? A few of us. Now, the healing tool is kind of our precursor to a bigger change, which is a skin smoothing tool. And I'll teach you that in a minute. So don't try to smooth out or even out someone's skin. Just try to get rid of any little bumps or anomalies that could be distracting, because we'll, we have a better tool to smooth skin. So you, sometimes this can take a minute, sometimes you can spend a lot of time on it, right? It depends on your subject. We'll say that that's good. Again, we're creating false reality here. Now, um, once we determine, okay, we got all the healing done, you can look at before and after here by clicking off this layer. We want to create uh, a smoothness to the, the subject's skin. What I'll usually do in this case is if I'm happy with the touch-up and I know I don't want to go back on it, I will shift-click them together and merge them. Oops, I want to merge linked. So I have a, a composite image because I'm going to use that composite image to actually smooth her skin. And to do that, I will drag the image so I have a copy, a touch-up copy, and then I'll name this one maybe Smooth Skin. And then most people who get into Photoshop for the first time are going to feel like, well, if I want to smooth something, it would be nice to blur it up. We've done Gaussian Blur before. But blurring, um, you lose too much texture and you lose a lot of definition. So there's actually a tool that I prefer, um, and it's called the Dust and Scratches tool. It's not, it wasn't originally made to do this, but I find that it's very effective. So if you go up to your filter menu and you go down to... I have to remember what it is. Noise. And choose dust and scratches. So filter, noise, dust and scratches on our final, our smooth skin layer. It's going to bring up a couple sliders for us. 
I don't worry about the threshold, I just worry about the radius. And you notice as I pull this up, look at her skin. Now she's going to get kind of blurry, but her skin's going to get really nice, right? We got rid of a lot of stuff down here. She has very smooth skin now. Too smooth. And it kind of, we lost detail in her eyes and stuff. But all I care about at this point is skin. So I'm going to click OK. Now, because I've done it on its own separate layer, we have some options. This is our original. This is our smooth skin version. I'm just going to look at her skin. I'm going to pull the opacity all the way back. And I'm going to start to tease it up and just look at what looks very natural on her skin. Okay? You guys tell me when it looks good. Too much, too little. Remember her eyes and stuff. Don't worry about it. We're going to fix that. You say that's good? 40? Okay. So how can I bring her eyes back? Erase. Erasing, but even easier if I mask it in case I mess up, right? So I'll click on my mask tool. I might want to zoom in a little bit. Get a paintbrush. Make sure it's soft. I might want to hit it at 50% so I'm not full blasting it every time. And I'm going to click and I'm going to bring back in areas where it's important that she has detail. And I might want to get different sizes of brushes to paint this back in. But her eyes come back. Her nose holes come back. The line between her lips comes back. I'm going to go through first and just find any areas that are really important to bring back. So her face was really important. Now her hair is probably really important and I may not want to hit it at 50%, I'll just go 100. And when I do this, you see how all the lines in her hair come back, all the little strands. The headphones come back, her fingernails. And you can be as methodical or as sloppy with this as you want or as you feel you need to. Um, one thing that's going to be a little tough with this one is this cord. I might just want to click and try to follow it. I'll reduce my opacity because it doesn't need to be all the way sharp, but better than it is. You see how it's kind of coming back? All right. So in a few short steps on her face, zoom it out. We started here, right? We've got some issues. We fixed the issues, and then we smoothed her skin. Let me pull it up just a bit more. And it's a pretty dramatic change, right? You guys agree? We may want to go in and whiten her eyes and touch up her eyes, which I'm going to show you on another image. But this is kind of when you hear like, oh, that image is airbrushed in a magazine or whatever. This is modern airbrushing, a little easier. Again, there's a lot more you can do. You can do some dodging and burning on this. We talked about that, I think, one or two classes ago, dark darkening and lightening certain areas to create more contrast. But this is uh, just a really good basic workflow. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. And we're going to move to folder number three, which is entitled Workflow. What I want to show you is, if you open up all, This is an image that's been photo treated, and uh, this is how it's kind of come out of the camera with uh, some camera raw treatment. If you open up the update file, you'll notice I have the same image, but what I did is I created a layer on top, and on that layer, I'll go ahead and throw it away, I basically wrote notes to myself of what needs to be done. This is very common in a, in a workflow, in a professional environment you're shooting like a cover of a magazine or something. So you will sit, look at this image, instead of doing it on the fly and trying to, to remember which areas need to be fixed and which don't, <coughs> you make a layer. So I click a new layer, I get a paintbrush, doesn't matter what size or shape, whatever you feels best. You get some kind of a color, I'll do red because that'll show up really well, and uh, get a little smaller brush, and you start to annotate your image. So you say, okay, I want to get rid of this mole here, move this up. I want to smooth this area here, get rid of that little wrinkle, this area, that area. I want to do some work on her eyes, that will remind me that. I want to smooth her forehead. 
And by the time you're done like with this, you know, we want to reduce this. The time you're done, you get an image that's marked up pretty bad, but this becomes kind of our map of reference. Then I'll hide this image, copy my original, and get working on it just like we did on that other girl. Okay? So it's uh, very common as you're working through a process to go back and forth on something like this to do a review. The reason why I share that with you is sometimes you can get zoomed in and hone in on so many things. Either you overwork the picture, you just get everything and then it looks way too fake, or you don't notice things because you're zoomed in and by the time you pull out, you've wasted all your time on areas that maybe weren't that important and ignored the ones that were. So if you can kind of look at it with fresh eyes and say, all right, to make this a perfect image, what would I do? Make little notes and then refer back to those notes. I think you work quicker, more efficiently, and more effectively. And so that, that's how I do it personally. All right. One of the things, I'm going to come back to number four in a minute. One of the things that I get uh, questions on a lot is eyes. Is about how do you make somebody's eyes look really cool. So I thought I would show you. Here's, here's an image as it came out of the camera with a little bit of color treatment. This girl, uh, you can see she's got big blue eyes. And if you just looked at them as they are, you'd say, wow, that's great, right? But how do we add soul? How do we add sparkle to her eyes or make them look more engaging? They say, what, the eyes are the windows to the soul? This is, uh, when you talk to, to a photographer, this is one area where they can make a big dramatic effect with, with an image and actually keep it kind of subtle as far as like it's not doesn't look over processed um, eyes are really really important eyes also reveal where your light sources are when you took the image this was outside so technically if you zoomed in here and this was a high enough resolution you could probably see right there's the photographer you see him there's his head and his body there's a I think it's a store that's behind him there's a blue sky right we come over here see the same thing I think that's pretty cool we don't notice that in photographs, but the eyes are basically a reflection of light. So in this instance, what do we do to her eyes to make them look really cool? I'll show you a few different things. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the layer in case I want to work on it. Um, usually I try to work above it, but just in case, I have a clean copy. And then I'm going to look at her eyes and find what areas can I improve. Well, right now there's some lines here from her hair and some little veiny things. So there's a couple ways I can attack that. One is just to kind of zoom in on it and say, all right, I'm going to create a new layer on top of this layer, get my clone tool we just used before to remove a nose ring, and I'm going to clone up some color and try to click out some of these little distracting details. Oops. Got a little skin from somewhere. Okay, I'm going to jump over to the other one. Oops, here we go. Now you could also try your healing tool to see if it works. Um, but basically we want to use, this is like Visine, right? I'll let you do that, man. <laughs> I just watched that the other day. Yeah, it was, it was on TV. It was on the television. I watched it. Yeah. I love that movie. All right. So there's a little improvement, right? Now, depending on how subtle we want to be, we may want to pull the opacity on this and show a little bit of the gunk so it looks more realistic. I'm not going to, but that's one consideration. Anytime you're dealing with eyes or teeth, if you make them too good, you'll start to look a little fake. We could whiten her eyes a little bit, and that's uh, as easy as creating a new layer. This is the ghetto way to do it, but it works great. Getting a white paintbrush, make sure it's a soft brush. I'm going to hit it, not at full opacity, and paint some white in, and then adjust the opacity. Now this is something that can make people look possessed very quickly. Okay? 
So I get my eraser and kind of clean it up just a hair. Wow, these are big. Okay, so that's way fake city, right? But I'm huge on opacity settings, so I'm pull back and just use this to tease it up a hair. That makes a little improvement. Right? Is that too fake? I mean, she's pretty, she's staring pretty hard. It might be a little fake. But once we add some soul, I think it'll work itself out. Most important thing on eyes is uh, what I call adding the soul, and that's adding some lower reflection in the eye, and then we can mess around a little bit with the color. Um, let's do the color first. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make... Uh, Oh, there's two things. If we want to use their natural color and just kind of amplify it a little bit, we could work on this layer we, if we want or make a copy. I'll just work on this one. Go over to our tool palette and right under here where we have our dodge, our burn tool, there's a little smudge, or sorry, sponge tool. That sponge tool either desaturates, you can see up here at the top, or saturates pixels in an image. If I saturate it, I'm going to make it much what? more vivid, right? So if I choose saturate and get a paintbrush that's a decent size, I can come over here to her eye. Now I'm going to overdo this because I can always adjust opacity on this one too, right? But I'm going to come in here and click in this area and I'm going to get real rainbow city. Now that's not reality, but that adds a lot more drama, right? There it was. And then I can tease it up. Also, if I say, you know what, I want to make her eyes another color, I could click a new layer, get a paintbrush, get uh, red. <laughs> Let's make them a little more green or red. Come in here, okay, full opacity. Paint green around the. Is it the cornea? I should know. Iris. Iris, there we go. And then change it from normal to color. And then adjust the opacity to whatever I think works out good. So now she has very green eyes, right? So these are all nice tricks and techniques. Again, this is where we started with her eyes. Here we've added a little more drama. The last thing I do, and probably the favorite thing I do, is add what I call soul. And this can be done two different ways. Um, the ghetto way is just to get some white paint. The more professional way is to use uh, a dodge technique. And I want to teach you the dodge technique. We've done this before. It's just a different use. If we click on a new layer icon down here and hold down Option, it brings up this little palette. If you remember this palette, we changed the mode from Normal to Overlay and fill it with Neutral, 50% gray. It gives us a new layer up here that when we start painting dark on it, it deepens the colors underneath. It doesn't go black, it deepens them, and white lightens them. So I'm going to get white in my color palette. I'm going to get a paintbrush. I'm going to zoom in on her eye. And I'm going to paint a little crescent shape right here. I'm going to come over the other side, paint a little crescent shape right here. And I may even touch up some of these highlights in her eyes by just clicking on them. Now as I zoom out, it's way too much. But you see she how she's like turned into a wolf. <laughs> it's kind of a, a it's, it's this look of soul, like there's something going on there. If I pull the opacity back, this is where we were. As I creep that up a little bit, it doesn't need to be very much. But you see her eyes get way more glassy. Now she's kind of got a funny look on her face. I don't know if this is the best one to, to do a lot of eye work on. But that adds a lot more drama and detail to this photograph. And in fact, I'll increase the levels of, or pull back the levels on all of it just to make it look a little more even to you guys. But that image versus that image, 
are pretty different, right? And it's, it's that those eyes are just such an important part of, uh, of the kind of personality and depth, especially, you know, obviously when you're shooting people. So if all I did, if I didn't do any of the other stuff, but just painted those little moons, so this is, this is her naturally. Painting those little moons, I could even afford to bring it up. You see the difference that makes? It's pretty cool. So clearing her eyes out and stuff, that's nice to do. But those moons, you can do like in literally 10, 15 seconds. And that makes a photograph look from being very flat and ordinary to something that was like lit in a studio. And wow, they've got such awesome eyes. Uh, you can have a whole lesson on eyes because you can actually go in and paint in little striations of other color. So if I wanted to put a little more brown in here, it would be really easy for me to click a new layer, get kind of a, a brown color, get a paintbrush, kind of maybe paint some little spots, make, make it even smaller, do some little stripety things, get maybe a deeper color of brown and offset it. And then go from normal to color or from normal to like multiply. Multiply is no good. <laughs> so let's try color. Depends on what we're using. And then I could even blur it a little bit to make it more natural. Filter, blur, gosh and blur. Bring it back. You see that subtle little change? It puts a glint in her eye. Zoom in on that. So you could do tons of awesome stuff with eyes. Um, questions about that? All right. So quick review where we're at right now is we've done eyes. We've done smoothing skin. Fixing zits and blemishes. We've done liquify, making fat parts skinny or skinny parts fat if we need to. Um, we've talked a little bit about the workflow of how we identify these things when we work on our image. Um, I've given you guys some direction before. Here's a, another image that, that needed some help on how to smooth areas out, how to adjust the background, so in this case I just put a little squiggle on the background to let me know that it would probably be a good idea for me to copy this, maybe do a hue saturation and saturate the background or change it up a little bit and then mask her out. We've talked about that before. Um, and then applying a lot of these things that we just learned on, on obviously modifying or changing the image, right? So these are quick and easy, dramatic effects that we can do in Photoshop. Um, so I want you guys to kind of mess around with that. But I wanted to teach you one other example of something you can do that's in and of itself. It's not super critical that you use it or do it all the time, at least for not for this trick. But it's going to kind of open your eyes to some other depths or uh, corners in Photoshop that we might not have thought of. This is a poor example, but it's an example of how to paint facial hair <laughs> or how like if you needed to make somebody's eyebrows or eyelashes bigger or better or if you just want to create a bunch of cool paintbrushes in Photoshop that are customized. So I'm going to teach you how to do this. What you need to do is you need to open an object. It could be anything. And you need to create a white background. You can get rid of it later. I'm just going to open up a, a, a blank layer and fill it with white paint. And you need to create a shape for a brush. And the easiest way to do that is to get black, get your paintbrush, make it like a marker. If In this case, I want to make it like a marker. Depends what you're doing. And paint the shape that you want to become your brush. And you'll see this in a second. For the hair thing, I'm just going to paint like some little squiggles. Say so that's my paintbrush. What I need to do now, this is where the magic is, is I get a rectangle marquee tool and select the part that I want my brush to be and I go edit, define brush preset and I'm going to call this 
airy face. Click OK. What Photoshop does is it looks for the contrast between the black and the white, and it creates a shape for you that then will be replicated as a brush. And then we can go in and change the dynamics of that brush to make it react or act more like hair or like a, a straight line or have it foreshorten itself. We've got lots of options. So I'm going to go ahead and delete layer one. I'm going to go back to the guy. And I'm going to click a new blank layer with nothing on it. And I'm going to challenge myself to start to paint a, a beard or a mustache on him. To do that, I want to choose two colors. I'm going to choose one that's pretty dark, almost black. And then I might choose one, in this case, it's a little bit darker brown. Being that if I just painted this all black, there would be no light or form on it. I want it to have a little glint of color that will create some form. I'm going to zoom in on his face. I'm going to go ahead and click on my paintbrush tool. And over here at the top, we know that we have options. If I click on the size option, I come down. Lo and behold, there it is. If I click on it, you notice it's pretty huge. And as I drag it across, that doesn't, it's not using the brown, and it doesn't at all look like a beard. It looks like paper dolls or something. So I need to make some changes. To do that, I need to make sure I have my brush selected. And then you see this little icon right next to it? Is that the one I want? Yes. <laughs> click on it, and it brings up your brush preset panel. So you see this? We want the brush tab to be up. And this gives us all the different characteristics that can occur with my brush. The first thing I can look at is the size. This is way too big. Now we know how to, to change the size normally by just clicking on the brush over here and adjusting it. You notice as I move it down, it moves down in the preset. That's fine. You can do it either place. But that brush was just way too big for me to, to work with. So I want to get something that's a little better size. The next thing I want to look at is the axis. Do I want it to be straight up and down like that? Do I want to turn it a little bit so it goes the other way? Do I want to squeeze it? Maybe so. So you can decide what you want to do with your brush at that point. You notice there's also a spacing feature. Right now it's set always at 25. That means as I click, we're seeing the little repeating portion. If I wanted it solid, I'd have to put it at 1. That just makes a solid line. If I want to space it out a little further, I just pull it out. You notice my sample here gets pulled out, and those pull out a little further. So those are the, the first options I can look at. The next thing is if I go to Shape Dynamics, if I come over here to Size Jitter, and I pull this up, it's going to basically kind of vibrate my brush so I get different sizes as it spaces itself out. I can do Angle Jitter. If I move that up, you see how down low it's twisting it? That's pretty cool. That looks a little more like hair, right? The mustache. I've got roundness jitter. I can flip the X and Y coordinates on it. i got a lot of op options there. Scattering. If I click on that, I can scatter it. Look what happens. Whoa! Right? The count, I can make it random in how it, how it spits out these little pieces of, of hair in this case. I can go texture. I'm going to come down to color dynamics. And I think I go to foreground and background jitter. So if I move this up, what will happen is it will grab both of these colors. And I can jitter the hue and a few other little things. And it makes it just that much more random. There's all these different things you can do here. In fact, one of the cool things, and I don't remember off the top of my mind what it is, I might have to find it for you, um, is when you paint uh, with it. If you were doing stitches on like a hem, you want the stitches to, to turn as you turn your paintbrush, right? Like, like a sort of sewing machine would do. So I've, I've had to do illustrations where I've had to put a fake hem on something. You can get the brush to change directions as you move your mouse in different directions, which is really cool. And I'll, I can look, look that up if you guys want to figure out how to do it. Anyways, once you have it how you like it, then you can simply come over to your image and you can start to paint. So I would probably, in this case, it looks like you've got a little bit of green in there. I probably adjusted the, uh, the hue jitter too much. So I'll pull that one down. All right. And you can start to paint in your, your mustache or your beard. Now, in this case, um, I would use different sizes and different opacities, and I might you know go in and 
and fool around with it a bit more. Um, doing like the devil goatee thing here. So we may want to give him like the unibrow. No soup for you. <laughs> <laughs> you could give him, you know, sideburns, whatever. But you can see that you can quickly build an effective brush. Now this one, I definitely want to spend more time trying to make it look a little more natural. But this gives you a lot of options, not only with your painting and drawing, but with your photo manipulation. Because if you had to replicate hair or uh, a, a texture, maybe it's a feathered texture on a shirt, you want to make something look fuzzy, this is a quick, easy way to do it. Um, and because you're painting on its own layer, it's always completely independent. You can adjust your opacities, you can mix layers, you can change the size of your brush. And if any of you like to draw, um, if you use just your regular brushes, they, they don't look like a pencil, right? But you can quickly create a brush, even this beard brush, if we change it a little bit, to make it come out like a pencil. So if I didn't have all the hue and saturation jitter on this one, if I went into scattering, maybe scattered it just a little bit less. The shape dynamics, and I didn't have the size change quite as much. And uh, perhaps if I went to the spacing, pulled it in a little bit, maybe the size made it a little bit smaller. You see how that looks like a zoomed in pencil line? If I start to draw and paint with this, you see how this reacts a little bit more like a pencil? I can even you know change the opacity or the, the thickness. But those lines, especially as you print them out and zoom in, look much more like a pencil or like a, an inked pen, depending on how you want to do it, than just your traditional brush. So people who do a ton of illustration in Photoshop make their own brush sets. And you can go out online and you can download sets. You can buy some, some are there for free, that work more like uh, watercolor brushes or, again, pencils, illustration brushes. They have pressure settings so that as you're, if you have a stylus, as you're pushing along, it will fade out on the edges. There's, it will have others that it, they'll taper, and depending on the speed. So if I hold it down, it will just start building, building, building. But if I went like this, whoosh, really quick, it would start out thick and it would get thin. So if you enjoy illustration, brush making, and learning more about brushes is a huge advantage for you. All right. Um, so... Are there questions? We've covered a lot. There's tons more that we could cover in photo sweetening, but we've done so much manipulation and stuff. You know, I want some of the semester to be devoted toward uh, layout and design. But I, I feel that if you guys just understood the tools that we've talked about today and, and you know, in classes past up till now, you would be as skilled or more than most designers out there. Like, there's just some really heavy techniques and tricks you can use in mastering these and using them in conjunction with one another make you uh, super happy and rich. All right, any questions? Okay, so what I'm going to do is give you your assignment. Go ahead and push stop on this recording.